something got cut off. That's not how that song normally ends, but I guess here we go. That was our walk on music abruptly ending, and uh, I'm Greg Niemeyer, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you this afternoon to a special guest lecture by Professor of Art Practice Stephanie Suhuko, who is going to speak about creative proposals. And speaking about creative proposals, I'm reminding us of uh, Francis Haugen testifying in the Capitol about Facebook and about the need for regulation of online uh, content, especially social media. And uh, I want to remind you that every law is initially a proposal. And so when we think about creative proposals, we can also think about what kinds of laws would be both new and creative, but also fair and just. And so um, that is a creative process as well, the process of creating new laws. But we're not going to do that today. Today we're going to introduce our guest speaker. And uh, in order to do that, I wanted to remind you of uh, the guest speaker inspired project called Blue Sky Proposal, in which uh, the students who are taking this course um, um, get to design a uh, building that would go in this location right here on University and um, Oxford, which is uh, currently being torn down. It used to be a, a garage and a bike store and an enterprise uh, rent a car facility. And all that is being uh, torn down and something new is going there. And what it is, well, we don't know, but we can imagine uh, and we can invent a blue sky proposal. So um, I hope this lecture today is going to inspire you thusly and uh, you'll come up with amazing blue sky proposals. And on Friday, of course, uh, tomorrow, we're going to go visit the site with your amazing GSIs, Jacqueline and Irma. So I uh, hope you're all looking forward to that. I'm certainly looking forward to the projects you will make. So now it's my special pleasure to introduce Stephanie Zihuko. I don't think I've ever introduced you because uh, even though we've been working together for many years and uh, so for everybody else, um, uh, Stephanie Zihuko is an associate professor of art practice at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, Stephanie got their MFA from uh, Stanford University and their BFA from SFAI. Uh, Stanford University has a wonderful MFA program that uh, produced amazing uh, uh, educational outcomes for, for many people. Uh, such as Stephanie. And uh, um, Stephanie is a really visible artist around the world, uh, won a uh, Joan Mitchell Foundation grant in 2019, uh, which is important, the Guggenheim Award in 2014, which is uh, very important, and finally also an R21 video coverage uh, um, from uh, PBS, which uh, shows Stephanie's work um, in, in uh, and also her studio here in, in at UC Berkeley. And it's a wonderful clip to watch. And uh, I think I asked you to watch it on Tuesday. I hope you all did. And uh, if not, it's uh, you can always jump on the video link right here. Um, <clears throat> uh, one important moment in Stephanie's career was uh, a moment where, where she went to a mall, I believe, uh, during a residency. So if you can get art residencies right around or anywhere in the world, you never know what it leads to. In this case, um, Stephanie went to a mall to um, to look for patterns and uh, fabrics that I think were uh, imported from around the world that, that were classified as kind of exotic fabrics and uh, dressed herself in these fabrics and made herself almost invisible and disappear um, behind this uh, uh, fake uh, sort of cargo culture, exotic manufacturers, exoticness. And uh, those photographs became extremely, uh, extremely impactful because they made people think about uh, texture and pattern in new ways and also identity in new ways and um, and visibility and invisibility in new ways. And so MoMA in New York, Museum of Modern Art in New York, showed those works in 2018 in a show called Being New Photography. And uh, they were became sort of uh, a big hit around the world and uh, it was really wonderful, wonderful to see the impact of Stephanie's work that way uh, from circulating from one place uh, all, all all around the world. And uh, uh, most recently, I think uh, uh, the, the the most notable show was at the St. Louis Art Museum, Contemporary Art Museum. It was a major installation with many flags and exciting things. And um, I think Stephanie's going to talk about that. Um, so uh, Stephanie creates large scale spectacles of collected cultural objects, cumulative archives, and temporary vending installations often with an active public component that invites viewers to directly participate as producers or as distributors. Using critical wit and collaborative co-creation, her project leverage open source system, shareware logic and flows of capital in order to investigate, and I would also say subvert, 
uh, issues of, of economies and empire. And as an example, I think uh, Stephanie made a, an installation at Freeze Art in London, where she and her collaborators made copies of the artwork that was in the show um, and sold them at a much lower rate. So they fabricated copies in real time of artwork that was in the, in the exhibit and sold it at a much, much discounted rate, which was really fun. So born in the Philippines, Stephanie lives and works in Oakland, California, and of course teaches at UC Berkeley. And uh, so just to illustrate um, how uh, one, of, one of her works, I wanted to share this flag with you. Uh, that um, uh, flag is actually described by Mark Twain as he criticizes in, in 1902 the, uh, the uh, uh, occupation of Philippines by the United States. And uh, he, he says at some point that the US flag might as well replace its stars with skulls and its white stripes with black stripes to show sort of the, 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 the death dealing process of colonization um, in the name of the United States in, in the Philippines. And uh, so I think uh, Stephanie came across this passage and uh, interpreted literally and produced the flag that Mark Twain inspired and thereby produced a lot of these um, subversive and uh, uh, incisive questions uh, concerning issues of economies and empire. So with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Stephanie Siuko. Thank you so much, Greg. There you go, you're ready to go. Yeah, great, thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here. I mean, I usually lecture to my classes uh, so having a larger audience and also having this broadcast, you know, internationally is always wonderful. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this. And also Paris, thank you for organizing. Um, okay, so I noticed that the talk was advertised online as new aesthetics, and I've actually modified it slightly. So I'm, I'm calling it new old aesthetics. And that's because the term new made me think about a lot and actually made me kind of question if it actually applies to my artwork. And it also makes me think about if there's a new aesthetic, is there an old aesthetic? Like, you know, what, what do we value when we say new versus old? And are we always looking to the new as some kind of answer as opposed to not having it answered by the old? And so what's new? And one thing that I like to point out is that a lot of my students, uh, my undergraduate art practice students, like to ask this question of each other. Do you work in digital or traditional? And I always think that's such an interesting binary because somehow it posits that those things are two very distinct things and that there might actually be a value on one versus the other. And so as a contemporary artist, I make no distinctions. I actually feel like you know, having this sort of like old and new, which I think is actually um, sort of suggested by the question of digital or traditional should be collapsed because you know, that sets up a binary that actually doesn't exist. And then the same too, in terms of thinking of the term new media, like if there's a new media, what's the old media? And why is it all of a sudden old? And does that mean that it's irrelevant? So another funny thing to think about is this kind of cyclical way that we think about things between going back and forth between new and old. And that in, in a lot of cases, it's contextual. So what's new when the new new is the new old, is the old new, is the old old, and then finally again, the new new. So anyone who's you know, looked at fashion or film or any of the kind of creative industries can see a kind of recycling all the time. So I think what I'm interested in is actually a kind of collapse of time and space and also of the difference between or the not the non difference between the contemporary and the historical. And here, you know, if you Google image Google new, obviously, this very exciting, you know, kind of signage comes up. And then we start to think also about the ways in which capitalism seems to promote the idea of newness as somehow, you know, shinier, glossier and more promising than what's come before. So I also like to say that my work recycles, copies, resuscitates, warps, reframes, makes do, rips off, plunders, and hinges on existing forms and historical aesthetics because the past is still unfinished business. And I think, you know, especially um, in recent years, the notion of the kind of phantoms resuscitating from the past are definitely still with us. And, you know, what does my work look like? Um, this is sort of a broad overview of large scale installations 
that usually involve the production of hundreds, sometimes thousands of objects in either a collaborative or participatory way, and then displayed as installations that are um, supported by museums or institutions. And it's a very specific way of working, actually, because you know, there's the kind of, um, there's the stereotype of the artist who works in a solitary way in their studio and kind of hides their work and sort of closes themselves off you know, in order to kind of have their vision uh, uh, put forward. And my work is actually, um, in many cases, the opposite. It, as, as I stated, it hinges on so many other things in the world. And it also uh, encompasses lots of different disciplines. And so like I was saying that I don't really make a distinction between say the traditional and the digital or you know, new media and old media. And it's because if you look at this constellation of things, it's, it spans everything from you know, textiles and craft to digital 3D objects, workshops, public pedagogy, and then also you know, more kind of, I guess, traditional forms such as sculpture, installation, video, and photography. And then I also see my work operating in multiple spheres. So again, to kind of take it out of the stereotype of the artist as being you know, only relegated to the gallery or only you know, speaking to a small audience, I like to think that there's this kind of diagram where the red dots are actually where my artworks operate. And so that could span the quote unquote art world the public, which is really you know, a much larger sphere and should actually be more outsized than this circle gives it. And then also the academy, which is where we are right now, and the kind of institutional and pedagogical space that you know, promotes um, the sharing of ideas and also a kind of growth. So the first project I'm going to show, and I'm going to walk through a number of projects, and I'm also going to talk about the behind the scenes of how they were made. And partly it's because, you know, the description of the talk was inviting me to do so, and I rarely get a chance to do that. Most of the time as an artist, I'm asked to present these very finished works as if they just dropped out of the sky and appeared out of nowhere, and then no one seems to, you know, kind of get the backstory of how these things are actually made. So the first project I'm going to show is from 2018, and most of the works I'm going to show are actually from the last three years. And in, I'm just excerpting a much larger body of projects, because I also like to say that I'm kind of like an athlete when it comes to being an artist. I overproduce and I make a lot of work. But this particular installation is called Added Value, and it was, um, I'm just going to read out loud the description. It's a 1500 square foot installation functioning as a radical reorganization of knowledge using quote unquote low value used books for sale to the general public. Conceived and organized by myself, featuring related tactics, the Prelinger Library, the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library, and commissioned by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So essentially what we're looking at is an artwork, but it doubles as a used bookstore. Only the logic of this bookstore is completely different. And um, the, the description of the work as it was published um, with the project was, how do the ways in which we categorize books and information reflect invisible power structures and hidden hierarchies? What would an intervention into this system look like? And how can artistic processes reshape, reorganize, and reevaluate it? So as a used bookstore in the lobby of the Museum of Modern Art, um, it consisted of an entirely reshuffled categorization process, where instead of, you know, if you walk into, say, a bookstore or a library, you're confronted with some pretty standard categories, such as world history, or Western history, or even art history, or, um, you know, literature. And instead of using those conventions, I decided, along with my collaborators, to throw that wide open and to relabel them based on a resistant kind of organization. And so as you can see from this image, everything from wealth and accumulation is a category as opposed to say business. Also revolutions is a category. And if you think about all the ways one can think about what a revolution is, you can think of about political revolutions, you can think about gender revolutions, you can think about all sorts of def new definitions for that category. So it prevents the kind of segregation that um, our existing uh, sort of uh, categories conscript us into and create and creates boundaries around. And what was also really fun is that with my collaborators, who are pretty radical folks too, we would have a lot of subcategories that definitely challenged how to think about these books. 
And so whether it was, you know, subcategories of how we learn to see ourselves through the lens of whiteness to when your culture becomes a trend and especially white women discovering themselves amongst the other. These are categories that if you occupy these spaces, you think about them in the back of your head, but you never see it reflected in the institutions around you. So to create that kind of structure was for me a resistant act and also a very temporary and temporal way to sort of tweak the general public's um, way of looking at the world. And the nice thing about this project too is that it, it, was, a, um, it was a benefit and it raised over $20,000 in two days at the museum to benefit the education and community programs for the San Francisco Public Library. Because we were getting the books as donated books from uh, the general public. And the, there's an organization attached to the, the public library that actually takes these donated books and then they sell them in their own bookshop. Uh, we, myself and my collaborators who I invited to work with me on this, we would go to the bookshop and, and kind of harvest and select books for our shop and then bring them over and then sell them from anywhere between, I think, a dollar and about five dollars. So everything was incredibly um, affordable. Uh, here's another subcategory of constructing the West through its global interventions. Um, and so, you know, what do you do or how do you start thinking about a category called uprisings as well as our carceral society? So instead of, say, the prison industrial complex, by claiming it as our carceral society, it's attempting to implicate us all. It's not apart from us or external to us. And then we also had some fun. So I came up with the craft and witchcraft area, which kind of collapsed everything from origami and like uh, textiles projects with actual Wiccan practices and um, uh, uh, witchcraft, because in the end, it's, it's all craft. I also created a men's studies area, and that's because you traditionally see in bookstores or libraries a women's studies section. And that also assumes, though, that a special section has to get carved out, as opposed to thinking that the entire bookstore should be seen as a women's section. And so if you segregated a men's studies area, what you're actually doing is you are scrutinizing masculinity and the formation of patriarchy. And these are fun books. So the other cool thing is, you know, a lot of our books were considered low value books because they were donated and many of them are outdated. You know, they don't function in the same kind of, you know, capitalist way. They're not highly in demand, but for our purposes, they became really interesting illustrations for our project. Uh, and I think this was the radical desires section. And then I also created a series of shrink wrapped book pairs. So you were forced to buy pairs of books together. And the notion being that, you know, one side on the other, you can't have one thing without the other. So Victorian gardens is obviously connected to cultural culture and imperialism, which is the kind of British foray into the rest of the world in order to accumulate all the things to create the beautiful Victorian gardens. And so as you as I was creating the pairs, it was a way to kind of play with these ideas and also create added value because as the books were bound together and labeled, we were I, I charged $10 for the pair, which was way more than say $2 each and people loved them. You know, so again, like reformulating and rethinking and actually creating new value. So, of course, Bill Gates, The Road Ahead and Collapse, wonderful pair. Um, the fun thing about this project, too, is we started to notice the same books coming up over and over and over. And obviously, that's a result of, a, you know, a kind of demand at a certain time. But then this notion, you know, that these things are obsolete or that, you know, they, they, they go back into the used bookstore system. And so here's a, a final shot of all the collaborators. And so as a um, as a organizer of the project, and that's how I see myself, it is my idea. And it is something that, you know, I kind of dreamt up, uh, up with, with the curators of the exhibition. Um, but crucially to me were my collaborators, because, you know, alone, I couldn't have had, you know, the amazing array of categories and topics and ideas. And so I like to give credit where credit is due. And so that includes uh, Megan Prelinger, Rick Prelinger, Michelle Carson, Weston, Weston Teruya, and Nate Watson. And so this is us posing with a kind of um, overview of all our subcategories. 
And then the other thing I want to stress that, you know, these projects are really um, intense. You know, they usually involve, um, I think it took about a year and a half uh, through the proposal phase to the prototype phase where you sort of investigate if it's possible to then generating the, the museum support because in the end, I am sort of pitching these ideas to the museum, even though I, I'm an invited artist. And that's kind of the way I work also. I get invited by a lot of museums to do new projects that are site specific and also reflective in some way of you know, a contemporary uh, theme. And so this is a, a, an infographic and kind of poster that outlines all the different areas of the project because a lot of it is invisible too. And so, you know, we commissioned artists to do new works in relationship to the project. We also had live events, performances, a film series, all these things that had to get programmed in as part of the, um, the exhibition. And um, I'd like to share this because again, you know, if I were just to show the, um, the image of the installation, there's a kind of loss, you know, of how rounded out the project was. And I'm also very hands-on with these projects where I design all the furniture and the components, and in some cases, the kind of flow of how the thing works. And I don't do that alone, obviously. Like I work with you know, project managers and other people, as well as you know, museum staff, volunteers, curators, uh, people who work at the San Francisco Public Library. And we're all kind of um, you know, working together to make these things happen. But it takes a lot of effort. And it, obviously, this is not the standard kind of you know, uh, studio art practice. Um, and then there's also working with the marketing teams, you know, just this whole sort of um, like PR campaign about the project. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit because, you know, that project was, I think, very publicly involved. And then I do have, you know, a more internal studio practice. And um, it has to do recently with the notion of imaging and photography um, as being a kind of fraught space for political and social um, uh, dilemmas. And you know, what we're looking at here isn't my work, but it's a kind of a stock photo shot of a uh, photo studio backdrop, which includes a green chroma key um, you know, screen and then all the apparatus that makes an image. And I think this image is interesting because it actually spotlights everything except for the subject of the photo. It shows that there's a kind of theatricality and a positioning of the subject that's highly composed and also highly um, art directed. And I think about this in the back of my head because um, when I do research on a project, I try to go deep. And I spent time at uh, looking at Civil War reenactments uh, right here uh, in the Bay Area, which sounds bizarre because the Civil War did not actually come to California. And yet every year there's this, uh, um, what's called Civil War Days in Guerneville, California. And that's where you literally can visit, visit the Confederate and the Union camps, as well as then watch the kind of uh, reenactment battle. And there's a whole culture around it, which is really interesting. And thinking about, you know, like, well, why? Like, why, why is there this constant revisitation around the Civil War? You know, what is it about the US, um, the United States' uh, um, subconscious that hasn't quite worked through what the Civil War was about and that it is over? And so, you know, here's a shot of uh, Union soldiers, um, you know, prepping for battle and, and getting ready. And then the most chilling thing actually was walking through the Confederate camp. And, you know, there's a quite popular, I mean, these are um, both the Union and the Confederate camps are equally uh, populated with people. And so the folks that are regularly a part of the Confederate camp, it really makes you wonder, you know, well, what is it about this that you're gravitating towards? And how could this also be perhaps a thinly veiled racist uh, activity? Not thinly veiled, actually, uh, quite out in the open. And, you know, so these are some scenes of the, the camps. Uh, enlist today, you know, this is the of asking people to join as if, you know, these things still uh, were happening. And then, you know, tourists uh, going through the camps as well. And this is a family of Confederates. Uh, so kids that, you know, are playing at this and uh, eating rations and, you know, sort of doing their, um, their thing. And then also drills for young people. And, you know, it's, it's amazing because I think in California and especially here in the Bay Area, you know, there's a misplaced assumption that, you know, that we're sort of all behind this and that's absolutely untrue. Um, this is obviously an extreme sort of like visual, you know, of how white supremacy is still um, actively played out. 
Um, there's also, obviously, there's Lincoln and Mary Lincoln, and they showed up. And I actually took a photo with them. Uh, you were allowed to pose with them, and that was pretty fun. Um, but, you know, the, so the whole culture around this was really fascinating. Um, there's an entire, you know, there's stores around it. There's a, um, people travel with, the, um, with different reenactment camps. Um, it's kind of like a, um, you know, like the Grateful Dead, where people like follow the Grateful Dead around. Um, and, you know, there's these photo studios also that take photos of the reenactors in kind of old timey um, uh, tin, tin plate images. Um, and then I, I started also noticing some of the weirdness of these spaces. So this is a hot dog stand uh, that's kind of masqueraded as a shack. Um, and then objects that belonged in contemporary times were covered and wrapped up in burlap sacks to kind of hide their, um, you know, their, their reality. Uh, porta potties. Uh, so how does this translate into my work? Because those photographs were not my works. Those were uh, research images. Um, so thinking about the extension of this kind of reenactment and thinking also about theatrical garments and costumes, there's a huge uh, category of, um, of historical American costumes. And they're made uh, you know, using um, like uh, contemporary sewing uh, patterns. So these are you know, uh, things that you could buy at say Joanne Fabrics. And they could be used for anything from you know, Halloween costumes to actual theater to actual reenactment. And so I bought a bunch of these and I decided to make from scratch um, three iconic uh, American garments, but using green chroma key backdrop photography fabric. And the idea was that thinking about American history as a kind of projection. And so if that green chroma key backdrop was always meant to be photographed and then digitally removed, what does it mean too when American history is something that can be malleable and that everyone can project their own version of it, whether it was, you know, the accurate one or not. And so the subjectivity of that, you know, in thinking about those Civil War reenactors and what they were getting out of it, and also what they were projecting onto that American history, was um, a way for me to work through, you know, the actual crafting of these garments. And so what we have here is a project called the Visible Invisible, and it was shown at the Smithsonian Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I was also really happy to have it at the Smithsonian because as an American museum, it seemed like the perfect place for this type of object critique. Um, so the first, um, uh, or on the very left is the Plymouth Pilgrim from uh, the pattern company Simplicity. In the very front is the Antebellum South. And so that Civil War era, you know, Scarlet um, O'Hara kind of uh, uh, finery. And then in the back is the, you know, 1776 colonial revolution from McCall's sewing patterns. And so when I do these projects, I do these projects. I mean, I learned 19th century ribbon embroidery techniques, lace crochet, and also hand sewing and uh, bonnet making. And you know, the reason I like to do that is because I wanna be fully responsible for the fabrication or even refabrication of American history. Um, and so a project like this, uh, to make all three of these garments took me an entire year because there's always the learning process. Well, there's the research, the crafted research process, the learning process, and then the making process. And so this is a detail of the bonnet, which, you know, has anyone ever here ever made a hat from scratch? Like, it, it's insane. And so, you know, trying to research, um, you know, all the materials and how to, how to do that, and then, you know, all this finery. I also wanted it to just be incredibly detailed um, because I do think um, American history has a tendency to elaborate upon itself. You know, it ornaments itself. It kind of, it makes itself up to be very fancy. Um, but then ironically too, some of these costumes are incredibly um, inaccurate. You know, like they're also kind of cartoon uh, forms. They're not um, historically accurate. They're meant to be a kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a generic version of American history. And maybe that's similar, um, for me, that makes me think about, you know, some American history classes I've taken where everything is just kind of like smoothed over and rolled into a kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, a mush. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the Plymouth Pilgrim and then the colonial revolution. So moving forward, um, again, looking back at the old and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so fascinated about why I, I'm still looking at history because, you know, maybe it's also because 
as I near 50 years old, I realize I'm not young anymore, or I'm not new. Um, and so, you know, by looking back, uh, by looking back historically, it's a way to sort of, you know, place myself in a lineage. Um, but, you know, the history and lineages are, uh, are quite anxious and also quite traumatic in many ways. So specifically looking at the St. Louis World's Fair, um, I was commissioned to do a large scale uh, solo exhibition at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. And as part of it, I wanted to research um, this event that happened over a hundred years ago, because St. Louis is um, incredibly famous for the World's Fair. Like in 1904, this was a massive, gigantic way for uh, both the city and also the general United States to create this giant exposition of technology, of resources, of empire. And it was open to the public and millions of people came to see it. So it functioned in a lot of ways. And in 1904, the United States was also a new, a new empire. Uh, they acquired uh, several new uh, colonies from Spain, including the Philippines. And so, you know, for me, and, and I'm, my family's from the Philippines. And so for me, I was looking at this, uh, this time period and this site as a kind of turning point as to when America saw itself as a colonial power. Um, so the St. Louis World's Fair also had what they called the Philippine Village. And that was a portion of the fair that was literally um, uh, uh, mapped out and uh, different buildings were erected and different tribes people from the Philippines were imported to then play in what were known at the time um, in human zoos. And so the, the display was marketed as being educational, but obviously it was a way for the United States to flex its, uh, its power and to showcase these brown people as needing somehow a civilizing component. And so I'm gonna avoid actually showing a lot of the degrading images. Um, you know, when I was researching this, I was in uh, St. Louis looking at the different uh, archives of the historical societies and museums and image after image um, was much less dignified than this one. Um, the reason I'm gonna show this one though, and I generally try to stay away from showing ethnographic images without a kind of intervention, is because I do think it offers an interesting um, example of how images are trafficked and also um, how they function even a century after they were taken. So if we see this as a historical image of some of the Filipinos in the St. Louis World's Fair, um, it's a free image. You can actually find it on Wikimedia Commons. And so that means that it's, uh, it's copyright free. It's kind of seen as a public educational resource. And so you can, you can find it here, but because it's free, it's also now commodifiable. So this is it found on a stock photo site where it's being sold because there's nothing that prevents the kind of uh, commodification of a free image, which is kind of ironic, right? And so um, here's where you can now buy that photo and use it at different resolutions for different um, possibilities. And for me thinking too about, well, you know, these images, they're historical, they're part of the public record, um, you know, that, that puts them in a kind of category of history that maybe we're safely away from, except when I see this type of commodification of the image, it's almost like a, a, a further reenactment of the capture of these folks, but through the means of the internet and capital. So what do you do though with that dilemma? Like how do you interact with images that are irresponsible or that you, know, you somehow need to reckon with or you don't wanna keep showing? And so that was my dilemma when I was approaching um, these images in the historical societies. And so this is a shot of me with my camera set up looking at files. And I had a very basic uh, reaction to it. So what I did was every image that I saw, I re-photographed uh, using my hands to block and cover the ability for the viewer to actually see that image. Because I wanted to both protect the people attached to the images, as well as also deny the ability to, to gaze at it, you know, to kind of like to take it in and to consume it in the way that the original people when they'd been imported were consumed. And so this work is called Block Out the Sun, and it consists, you know, it also talks about the early years of photography, because around this time, photography was kind of uh, becoming a, a more of like a middle class um, uh, a hobby. 
um, it was still very expensive, but you know, the camera and the way images started to circulate were um, mostly tourist images, um, you know, or you know, parts of uh, books or um, you know, ethnographic uh, photographs. But you know, this kind of very uh, specific way of interacting with the images, as well as intersecting my own hand, my own brown hand on top of it, you know, was one of the, the gut reactions I could think of. So the, the work is actually shown in a vitrine and it's shown in the round, which means that you're forced to walk around it um, in the middle of a room as opposed to just be able to gaze at it from one direction, because each way the hands turn and they sort of try to evade the proper viewing of the original image. And so a next and related project is that I actually was um, uh, uh, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship right before uh, COVID shut everything down. And I'm glad that I was able to get all my research in. Um, but I made a proposal because it turns out as an artist, you can actually propose uh, to be an artist research fellow at the Smithsonian. And I proposed to work with the archives of the National Museum of American History um, under a curator in photography. And I also was able to get access to all these other different Smithsonian uh, research areas. And that's kind of the beauty of this type of fellowship, actually. And they don't make you have an exhibition afterwards. There's nothing they ask of you. They just give you access for a year to all the, the archives and records, as long as you can kind of make nice with people <laughs> to, to have them give you access. Uh, and so, you know, like this is an image of, you know, what the museum looks like. There's a very, you know, kind of like lofty message it's trying to send in terms of, you know, the message of America. Um, and this is a, a, a shot of me in the archives. And, you know, so I would spend weeks at a time just calling up files and records and documents and images and then shooting them all day from like 10 in the morning to four at night um, without necessarily knowing what I was going to do. And that's also an interesting artistic process because I kind of had an inkling, but I had to go through the research and finding what was there in order to figure out how I wanted to use it. Um, I also had access to the online database, which everybody has access to. And I was interested specifically in seeing how um, images of the Philippines were reflected in the American archive, simply because the Philippines was a United States colony. And you know, what does the empire think of its colony. Like what records are in there? I wasn't searching for the Philippines in terms of like it being, you know, a real vision or some kind of authenticity. I was looking at the empire's vision of itself. And what I found was um, hardly anything of people. Everything was accumulations of uh, what is it like military records of uh, materials of uh, ethnographic um, things. Like here's a search for Filipino American in the Smithsonian, and it looks like the collection images are zero. Um, there's what 29 websites, you know, where they might have written an article about it, but there's nothing, 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 nothing in the in the holdings. And so, you know, that's really fascinating to me. So there's an absence, but you know, what else is there instead? Like, what are the placeholders? And so, what I found were um, really crappy evidence of uh, missing things or, or of a kind of phantom Philippine presence. And so what we're looking at here actually is a digital, digital photo of a tiny microfilm copy of a 19th century stereogram, stereograph photograph. So it's been multiply translated many times into a low resolution approximation. And this is the image we get. And you can't see the original because it's too fragile to actually see. And so I've been thinking about this kind of degradation of image as a sort of like um, degradation of our connection with the historical record. And along the search too, I found all these amazing metaphors for America and its own history. So this is from the 1920s and it's from a slide lecture called uh, the Better America Lecture Service. And this particular slide is supposed to show poverty. And it's all scratched up and, you know, kind of beautiful actually in that way, you know, where the absence and the damage is the thing that is portrayed. Uh, and so when I'm working on these things, I shoot a lot. 
I shoot, I shoot, I shoot, because I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I also rampantly download images. And so if something strikes me in the database, I download it, and then I accumulate it into these vast Flickr folders to reference later, because I never know what's going to hit me. But then I start seeing patterns. And so when I look at this pattern, I see a lot of damage, you know, images and photos that have been somehow, you know, the emulsion is lifting off, the image isn't portraying it properly. Um, there's even things that are mislabeled. Um, I shoot the file folders. I shoot the backs of photos because I never know if that's going to be interesting or important. It's all the things that you can't find online, actually. Because the other problem about digital um, museum databases is they only shoot what they think is important. And those things are usually not the things I think are important. And so, you know, we're already limited by the very, the digital database itself is an imperfect uh, collection. And so to actually go into the archives, I think, is still a resistant act because you will find things that you're never meant to really find. And so um, what I've done with these images is I'm still working through it. So the residency ended in um, early 2020, right before um, COVID hit. And this is a shot from my studio um, in New Orleans, where I was an artist in residence at the, at the Joan Mitchell Foundation right when things shut down. Um, and so I was printing things really large, stacking things, trying to figure out, you know, what to do with this mass of images and also how they kind of pile up on top of each other. And um, so they did wind up in an exhibition um, at Catherine Clark Gallery earlier this year. And the exhibition was called Native Resolution. And I, I consider these pileups and they're literally, um, you know, amassed from the downloaded Smithsonian images. And the other thing is I don't care about copyright. I sort of have this idea that because these images were harvested and produced under the conditions of empire, that it's absolutely okay for me to take them back. And so these are physical collages. I also use the low resolution qualities and I just own it. So instead of trying to find the, the high resolution image, you know, this is a detail of a, a three foot by four foot photo of a camera from the 19th century, which is actually heavily pixelated because that's how I found the image. Um, and then just, you know, really interesting details that I'm pulling out here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to skip forward, actually, because I'm going to get to the last project. Um, but again, these are details of the pileups. Uh, and these are details of documents from the, anth the anthropologist Dean Conant Worcester. And he was cataloging the Philippine, the Filipino tribes for the first time. And if you were to read the documents straight, they're incredibly racist and they're incredibly, um, you know, from the perspective of someone othering, you know, large, vast numbers of people. And so instead of representing those, what I decided to do was focus on the mistakes in the documents. So I rephotographed them with the mistakes front and center. And then everything you see on the peripheral are just snippets of the original document. But what I'm trying to show is that the, um, the documents themselves are fallible and that they are um, not to be trusted. And so I'm going to finish up with my current project, which actually isn't, um, it's going to, it's an exhibition that opens in January. And I was invited by the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, Texas, to respond to their collection of American art and create a site-specific project. And when they approached me, I was so excited because the Eamon Carter was founded on a really interesting American collection. And that's the, um, the paintings and sculptures of uh, uh, Charles Remington uh, and, uh, and others uh, in the, um, the mid to late uh, 1800s, as well as early 1900s. And a lot of this work too is, you know, the, the kind of cowboys and Indians um, work, the kind that's sort of celebrated as the American West. And so what do I do with that? That's, you know, that's a really good question. Um, these are shots of how the museum looked in the 1970s. And I was interested too in how the museum keeps making and remaking itself in relationship to current, you know, contemporary uh, themes of what America looks like. Um, so for these projects, I usually, um, and I'm invited to go out to do site visits. And in those site visits, it's when I meet with the curator and we look at the space and we look at the museum together and we try to come up with a project. So it, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of talking. There's also a lot of me looking at all the things around in the museum. And this is a fun model. So this is like an exhibition model that the curators have where they, they cut out little tiny uh, you know, printouts of like 
of paintings and they you know tape them up just to see if they'll work and i love this because they look like really you know terrible um wonderful exhibitions actually uh, but you know again these are not my works these are just uh these are research images you know but we keep coming back to these types of paintings because these are the ones that actually form the core of the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. The founder of it, Eamon Carter, this is his collection, and he specialized in this type of artwork. Um, so what do I do with that? You know, what do I do as someone who lives in the West, who is from the West, and is also, um, you know, thinking very hard about their place in American history and how to also kind of reformulate and rework it? So, uh, you know, this is me and the curator, uh, Kristen Gaylord, in the archives, also just digging around. Um, I start to notice things, and I'm showing, you know, images of like shadows of sculptures, um, almost as kind of phantoms. And again, this isn't work per se, these are just research shots. I also get to go behind the scenes into art um, archival storage areas, and I just thought it, would, it was great to have a disaster supply closet, you know, in the archives there. Um, Archives are amazing. You know, there, there's sort of weird metaphors that kind of pop up about how art is stored um, and sort of um, uh, put barriers upon. So this is looking at a, um, a reflective daguerreotype on the left. Um, also how art is labeled. So caution, art. I thought that was pretty great. And then some of those Remington sculptures also kind of wrapped in what looked like a, an archival saran wrap, you know, almost like a plastic condom around them. Uh, and I get to look at all sorts of like old books and things that can get called up from the archivists. So, you know, here's a very early, very famous um, ethnographic book of indigenous people that, you know, are obviously a kind of stereotype in many ways. Um, and, you know, so to look at these original documents and also look at the original paintings. So when I was looking at these paintings in the galleries, I was struck by the same narrative over and over and over, which was one of men doing things in the land. And so thinking about that and kind of focusing in, I started uh, really looking at the hands because the hands were really telling. There was a lot of activity in these hands. They were grabbing and holding and thrusting and uh, shooting and pulling things. Um, they, were very, they, they were very active. And then they were also doing things like negotiating and delegating and writing and pointing you know, so the, there was a whole also legal structure with the taking of the West and not just the kind of, you know, the physicality of the cowboys. Um, and then I was also looking at um, these beautiful kind of fanciful uh, um, artworks of the West, in this case by Albert Bierstadt, who is a German immigrant and did these um, uh, prints in the 1860s. And so my proposal actually, is uh, uh, these are two hallway walls and they're, the hallway walls are actually right across from each other but for the purposes of this proposal image I just stacked them. Um, they're 50 foot long walls by 15 feet high and I'm proposing two massive vinyl murals on each wall that use the Bierstadt prints as a kind of leaping off point. The first one creates um, a Rorschach image of one of the Bierstadt prints. So it sort of doubles itself and folds itself over onto itself. And then on top of it are gonna be um, digitally printed on aluminum uh, details of the man hands as I was photographing them from the paintings in the gallery. So the man hands start to kind of litter the landscape, literally doing onto the landscape the things that they did metaphorically through the paintings. And um, you know, so when the, when the viewer walks through it, this hallway is also the entrance to the main museum. So before even getting to see the real paintings, paintings you're gonna see this work first. And I kind of hope to set that scene of a kind of uh, counter narrative before people get lulled into the images of what they see in the museum. And then on the facing wall is another Bierstadt uh, uh, landscape, which has been rendered into a green chroma key backdrop. So again, kind of like a, a digital projection, a kind of background that can always be substituted or projected upon. And on top of them are four new photographs that I worked with. Um, this is a shot of the photo studio of the museum where they photograph the actual sculptures. And you know they have to photograph them very nicely for archival reasons. And so I worked with the in-house museum photo crew to re-photograph some of the uh, Remington cowboy sculptures but to do so in unheroic ways. 
And so right now the, the cowboys are positioned facing away and also against a black backdrop as if they're kind of melting into the darkness and even receding. And then um, intervening in it are also the labels, the tags, and the color calibration charts that show that um, you know, the whole thing is kind of stage managed and also part of a larger system of, of cataloging. And on the left are hands from the museum preparator who I asked to move the object because I'm not allowed to touch any of the objects. When I do these types of photo shoots, I'm usually surrounded by people to make sure that um, the insurance on the objects aren't, uh, you know, that I don't damage any of the objects. And so there's a lot of pressure about, you know, making the work and making the work correctly. But because of that, I'm also able to get a lot of access and try things out with these sculptures that I wouldn't ordinarily get to do if I was just a casual visitor. So here's, you know, myself also playing with notions of like sizing up, you know, a different cowboy or even just checking, you know, one of the uh, cowboy sculptures as it's, you know, ready to whip. And I think, you know, this is one of the last images, but this is a pullout shot. It's not one of the works that's going to be in the show, but it kind of shows the context and it shows the shoddiness of the area. You know, that when you look at the center where the photograph is taken, it's supposed to be removed from everything else around it. And I love the fact that the rest of it is so constructed and so fabricated. And uh, okay, lastly, this is, this is what a proposal looks like. And I'm showing it just because your assignment is to make a proposal. Uh, this is uh, an unrealized proposal. Um, I submitted it to the De Young Museum because we're gonna work on something in the future. I don't know if they like it or not, haven't heard back, but it's called Fiat Lux Glare. And uh, usually what I do is I have to put together a fake image. So similar to what you're being asked of your, um, your assignment, you know, I Photoshop together a placeholder image. And in this installation, I wanted to work with the American decorative, the reflective objects from the American history collection and display them in a darkened room and shine incredibly intense spotlights on them to highlight glare and create a kind of refractive, almost blinding surface. And so I have to write an overview, kind of similar to what you have to do. And then, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And then how I'm gonna do it, I don't think you have to go that far. Um, and then, you know, the challenges that I face when doing it. So this is part of the behind the scenes of how these projects get done. And then lastly, I'm gonna end with this image. <laughs> so this is myself at uh, six, five years old, five years old in 1979 with my mother at Disney World. And we just immigrated from the Philippines. And she took me for my birthday and we went to Frontierland and we posed as 19th century new immigrants to the United States. So similar to maybe what you would have found, you know, on the American frontier, this kind of fakery of belonging and this sort of attempt to insert oneself into American history. So with that, I'm going to end it there. Thank you. May we uh, ask you some questions? Please. So we have questions coming from the uh, Zoom uh, room. And uh, Jacqueline, do you have any questions there? And we have questions up here as well. So please raise your hand if you want one of our ushers, Kelly and Caroline, to bring the microphone to you. Yeah, I'm happy to answer anything. I'm very friendly. I I want to I want to start maybe with a question. Um, thank you for taking us through this uh, journey of um, various perspectives on history. And early on, you said um, that history uh, histories are not accurate. And um, do you think there ever is an, an accurate history, or do you think it's more important just to point out the inaccuracy of things? Well, that's a good question, right? Because I, I guess philosophically, you could say that everything is subjective. Right, I mean, philosophically, it's sort of like we all come from different perspectives, we all come from different histories. But I have to say, you know, in, in my sort of like, you know, looking outwards, there's definitely a, a privileging of a certain perspective that seems to dominate, you know, what happened or what, or how to even consider oneself an American. And specifically as an Asian American immigrant from a former United States colony, it's just so apparent how, you know, certain narratives are just completely left out. And even this notion of, you know, that just from a very specific standpoint that, you know, Asian Americans aren't really Americans, 
you know, this constant sort of shifting as to like, well, what country are you from? Where are you really from? You know, it's this constant othering um, that somehow has escaped, you know, actual um, Americanization in a way. But that's a good question because again, yeah, there, to, then to say there's a one history that we should all sort of be more aware of would obviously, um, you know, kind of stop short the, um, the questioning and the interrogation process. So, you know, perhaps there's this, um, there's this kind of opening that can happen rather than a consideration of, you know, uh, real versus fake. Yeah, yeah. You use those terms a lot. And uh, I really appreciate how in your work, the constructedness of histories comes out so clearly, even just in reframing the Albert Bierstadt print, which in, probably was meant to be cut down, but the way you present it, it has all the printer's marks on the sides and all the color samples, and they literally build up the image. And um, there's all these cultural factors that build up the image as well. But when we see the mechanical aspects of building up an image, the cultural factors seem to come along. So I found that it opens up the conversation about towards more broad views of history and more inclusive and more more accurate rather than absolutely accurate, but more accurate views, in, including the constructive nature of things. So um, any other questions? Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you so much. That was such an extraordinary, wonderful talk. I loved seeing um, all of your projects from the very beginnings, even just through your research and digging through the archives. Um, and I also love that so much of it centers on reframing and reclaiming American history, um, especially as, as also an Asian American, I think a lot of uh, American history that I'm confronted with feels like it's not my own. Um, but this is really special to see your, uh, you know, reversal and rebellion against a dominant narrative. Um, I would love to, so you kind of ended with, I wrote this down, um, inserting oneself into American history. Um, and I think that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, but I would love to know, it, clearly it manifests in all of your work, but I would love to know if there are any internal shifts that have allowed you to think this way or, or how you have kind of reframed it in your own head as you go about normal life and the world. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, I think, so I, I can point out that usually when I'm invited to do a project, I'm steered towards the, um, the Asian collection. And I think that's really interesting. It's like, oh, you should look at these, you know, images we have of Filipinos. Don't you want to do something with them? And I'm like, I'm also American, and I have just as right to talk about, you know, an American frontier history as anyone who's come after that. You know, simply because we inherit the legacy of America and all its problems. And so, instead of being um, sort of what I hope to do by doing these projects with the Eamon Carter, as opposed to say the Asian Art Museum which I've also worked with, and I've been able to do wonderful things with the Asian Art Museum. I do wanna expand the notion of what, what is expected of me. And there was a shift actually, um, oh goodness, I guess it was a couple years ago, um, maybe even longer, um, where I was noticing that the conscription of identity by the art world was ramping up. And by that, I mean that um, the notion that artists of certain um, ethnic backgrounds can only speak for that or should speak more about that because obviously there's a lack of it right so we should be getting these voices forward but then there's a myopicness in terms of you know well that's their specialty and they should stick with that when i actually think that my work now is all about the construction of whiteness and i love doing that work because it you know it's like my work is not actually about being asian american it's actually about uh whiteness and I'm happy to claim that actually. And I think we should be talking about that more. Thank you. Um. Hey, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, Irma. Thank you so much for that. It was amazing. Um, going off of that, how you um, I just was thinking how photography, you, you like kind of talked about theatrics of photography and how it was a fraught space and how, and then I was thinking about how that was, that was used as a construction of otherness and how you are then now shifting that and, and using photography to talk about the construction of whiteness. Um, so I just wanted to hear more about your relationship to photography. Yeah, no, thanks for asking that. So 
I'm not a trained photographer. And I think that's maybe why I feel so free in it. Like, um, it turns out, who, who here is like a photographer photographer? Is there anyone? There's like a whole universe of like, you know, technical skill, theory, like all the stuff that, you know, people, when, when they go to school for photography, they're like photo heads, you know, and they, all they talk about are lenses and all this other stuff. And I came at it from the direction of being interested in image making which I think is really different, right? The, the apparatus of, the, the, of photography is really about the camera. And I'm more interested in how images are trafficked and constructed and made. And that can happen independently of a camera. And so, um, but now I'm actually starting to learn photography. So like I have a good camera and, you know, and I'm constantly discovering better ways to do what I've been doing, which is both good and bad because I used to shoot all my stuff really poorly. Uh, on purpose, you know, I like the low resolution, I like the crappy, I like avoiding, you know, sort of the high end equipment, because um, I just want to resist that, you know, that you need those things in order to be pr proper. And so um, I have a very weird relationship to photography, but at the same time, I'm now asked to speak more and more about photography in photographic circles. So to get curated into the Museum of Modern Arts photography exhibition, you know, their, their major like every two years, you know, like these are the new photographers, you know, it was really fascinating because then I was put in, you know, the same space as people who literally spent their lives devoted to the craft. And then, you know, tomorrow I'm speaking to the Photo Alliance SF and those are all you know, mostly photographers who have dedicated their lives to it. And yeah, I, I think it's interesting. It seems like the field, you know, appreciates it, but I also wonder too sometimes how it's sort of like a, um, I don't know, like a fleeting, you know, interest on their part. Nice question. Yes, hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak more about the choice to only include women's clothing in the chroma key like dress thing and why not like soldiers clothing and so on. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I was thinking actually about, so the the women's garments or dresses are usually seen as a kind of, uh, they're, they're more like fashion, I think. You know, people think about it closer to fashion. Um, and there, I was also interested in how the, the female figure or identity is so closely linked to nationhood. So you think about, you know, like countries are always referred to as she's, and then the same with, you know, the Statue of Liberty is a woman. Um, there's also, I think, oddly enough, the sanctity of white womanhood that I think is, you know, a very powerful force that people don't talk about enough in terms of, you know, the protection of the country or even like, you know, um, it was always about, you know, the black and brown people um, disturbing, you know, the sanctity of the white woman. And, you know, that's a, that's a trope that's like, you know, deep. And so I used that um, on purpose, actually, the, 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 the figure, the female figure and the finery. Because also, you know, the ball gown on that Civil War dress is insane. I mean, there's so much labor attached to it and, and beauty, but hidden are, you know, the effects of slavery and the labor that went into the construction of that type of ornament. A couple questions in the chat that I could ask. Um, let's see. OK, um, I'll just, there's three here, so I'll just ask one of them. Um, Jeffrey says, hi, Stephanie, amazing talk. Thank you. I'm sad your green dresses weren't included on the red carpet at the Met Gala this year, but hopefully another year. When you were describing the block out the sun research, you mentioned that covering the photographs with your hand was one of the first reactions you felt. How often do you find yourself working with a first reaction versus ruminating about which direction you want to go in? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm usually creating three or four different um, varieties of, of works at the same time. So I was also shooting it without my hands, you know, shooting with my hands, shooting them upside down, shooting them with a shadow on top, shooting them, you know, it's sort of one of those things where because you get access to the archives so sporadically, or, you know, I'll make an appointment and I only have four hours. And I'm just like, oh my God, shoot, 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 you know, and I have to think of every variation that maybe later on might be fruitful. So, um, but some things do bubble up, you know, and it, it's more of like after sitting with it for a little bit, like what just, what just feels sort of like the, you know, the most direct, the best way to, to do it. 
But that's a great question because again, you know, this process is weird because you have to like make five different projects at once. Like for the Eamon Carter show, I also had like four other proposals and four totally different, uh, you know, installations that could have happened, but we had to choose one. It's back there and then back. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering how you, I guess, like developed to like do projects on these ideas of empire and whiteness. And even, I guess, from the very beginning, how you came about to do art. Um, because, you know, art is a very, is a craft that has a lot of, you know, directions to move into. And I feel like sometimes it can be hard to decide on one or even to you know, know what direction you want to go in. So how did you come about um, going about doing that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the, the nice thing is at this point, I've had 25 years of experience as a professional artist. So what you're looking at is like 25 years you know, of, in, of invisible kind of like process and labor and different jobs and you know, all the things that lead up to it. And so, um, but because of that, you know, I've been making art since, you know, my early 20s, like, you know, since undergrad. Um, and I think it, it's changed a lot. Like, if you go to my website and see the early stuff, I would say it's pretty traditional in the sense of it was like things that sat in galleries and did these things. And then it took my sort of like, um, I think, growing up a little bit and realizing that I could incorporate all these other interests into being an artist. You know, that it was actually like multidisciplinary and research driven and that I could like travel the world, you know, like, again, not to sort of stay in that hermetic, you know, track of being an artist, but also, you know, I've had multiple careers. Like I used to be a museum exhibition designer at the Smith, uh, it's not the Smithsonian, at the Exploratorium Museum, you know, and then I was a graphic designer for, you know, immigrant rights advocate organizations. And then I was, you know, so I did all that in parallel with being an artist. And that's probably also what helped me expand my interest as an artist. And then the good news is my family, you know, as a first generation immigrant, my family supported, you know, my decision to, to become an artist. And I know how important that is because, you know, a lot of people I talk to, um, do not get that support. But yeah, thanks for asking. Um, thanks, beautiful answer too. I um, appreciate it so much. Um, and uh, let's do more uh, Zoom questions. Okay. Um, Eric asks, are there people, institutions, places in the Bay Area that you would like to work with but have not been allowed? And I also have like a second follow-up question. I feel like this presentation was so much about your work that you do in collaboration with or but I'm kind of curious like what your process is in the studio when you don't have a collaboration. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So back to the museum collaboration or like who who I'd want to work with. Um, it's only the last I would say, I don't know, eight to 10 years that museums have started to invite me in to do these projects because in a lot of cases, there's a critic, a critical component that they have to be sort of ready for. Right. So in some cases, I actually hide the um, the outcome. So like with added value, they didn't see beforehand the the subcategories. You know that we were just like we're going to make resistant categories, and they were like cool. You know, and so as it was happening, it was one of those things. Well, well, you can't stop us, and it's not so bad anyway. And you know, sort of stretch that. But without the invitations, what I usually what I've done is what I call unsolicited collaborations where I literally work with an institution even though I've not been allowed to. And so I've gone in and I've um, worked with uh, gallery interventions, uh, photographing things in museums that I'm not supposed to, and I create works where I'm not invited. Um, and so it's ironic to start off in that sense and now be invited in. And then it always makes me wonder, you know, well, does that kill the work somehow? Like, does it, when the institution wants you to come and critique them, you know, does it sort of like neuter your message or does it actually push them forward a little bit more? But one of the nice things I've noticed is that within any museum, you know, despite all the sort of institutional flaws and shortcomings and ongoing work that they all have to do, there's always individuals inside of them that know it and that are trying to make change. And so I could say that with almost any institution, including, you know, our university. It's like, you know, there, and I, I try to work with the people that are, you know, either silently or outwardly supporting what I want to do within the institution. 
reminds me of a quick follow-up question. Would, would you, how many proposals do you write in a given month? And just because we're, you know, maybe this for some of us is not, not an usual thing, but could you say something about how intense that process is of working, working it out with institutions? Yeah, well, you know, so now I think of it almost as like a conceptual project in itself, because a lot of cases, I'm never going to be able to do these things, you know, like, this is maybe now that, you know, the de Young's like, oh, let's work together, you know, the de Young Museum in San Francisco, I can now think about real things there that might happen. But a lot of these things are, I don't let the, the, the I don't let the impossibility stop me from dreaming about it. So, you know, when I make these uh, proposals, they, they're for almost anything. And I actually have a whole website of proposals that I've started and they help me catalog things. It's called speculativepropositions.org, uh, I think, or something. Just Google my name and speculative propositions and it'll come up. And there's a lot of failed propositions. I call them propositions actually, because they're sort of more like, you know, well, what if? Uh, and there's failed ones, there's ones that have been denied, there's ones that have moved forward, there's ones, um, I see it as a way of like keeping myself um, excited about things rather than being stopped, you know, by, by reality. Oh, sorry, uh, I would, maybe five a year. I mean, you know, because I also have to make the, the real work. Like usually something happens, like right now I'm working on two solo exhibitions that open in January. You know, one is Eamon Carter, and then the other is a commercial gallery in New York that I work with. Is in the audience here? Yes, please. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I mostly wanted to kind of bounce off. I think some of the other questions, like I wrote it down in the beginning, I was like, I'm gonna wait to see if it's relevant. But um, as I like look at your art and like a lot of other things in the class and like we looked at um, the the um, art that's in the museum right now, like the exhibit that they have right now, I was thinking a lot just about a lot of times it is like you said, it's in reaction to like the history or what hasn't been talked about and kind of just like an overflow of emotion of what you know needs to be talked about. But I feel like a lot of times when you're looking at these pieces and viewing them, it's like almost like painful and like jarring because of like the reality of it. And so I feel like you touched on this a little bit answering someone else's question, but my question would be like, kind of what is the, what's your goal as you create these pieces that are like, you know, a reality that needs to be said, but is also like a painful reality that like that you kind of want to look away almost. And then like, what is the role in like healing from these different histories that have happened or, or like how did the art play into that? Yeah, wow, those are really good questions. <laughs> oh, I know, I've been wrestling with this too, actually, because I realized that my work, uh, a lot of my work is actually about amplifying anxiety, you know? And I, I, I'm still trying to figure out why, because I also have a lot of friends and I know a lot of artists that do the opposite. You know, their work is specifically about like bringing community together and healing. Um, maybe I could even argue that, you know, added value actually, you know, uh, for a lot of people that visited it became a way to, to feel seen, you know, and that was a, a kind of empowering thing. And so I wonder if, um, yeah, I don't know if I have the answer because I, I also realized that um, I don't think I'm done, oh, this sounds terrible. I don't think I'm, I'm finished uh, working through the trauma, you know, and maybe it's actually because I, I feel similarly, like, I don't have the answers to the, the healing part yet, but I want to make sure that we don't skip over what still needs to be unearthed and said, or else we've sort of kitted ourselves, you know, that now we can all come together. And, um, and so, yeah, thank you for that question because, you know, the personally what I've done, and this is kind of funny, after, a, after weeks and weeks of all days looking at racist ethnographic photography and archives, I go back to my um, wherever I'm staying on, you know, on that trip, and I knit for four hours. <laughs> you know, I actually have a hobby, like a really strong hobby, to just like decompress because I feel like you know there's a lot to take in and then figure out how to reprocess out. Yeah, but no, thank you for that question. I, I wish I I wish I was there, you know. Yeah. Um. Onwards to the online question, maybe one more. Lisa, I loved your question. Um, okay, let's 
see. There's a few here. Um, I watched your interview before and you mentioned about the 80-20 ratio, producing 80% crap to make the 20% successful art. However, do you classify, determine those 20% is considered how do you classify, determine that those 20% is considered successful art? Is it because they are accepted in public by public, the public in general? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, they're referring to in the, uh, the Art 21 video, I talk about this ratio of 80% of what I make is crap, 20% a failure. It's actually has nothing to do with public perception. It's more of like, at a certain point, I have to choose how much time I need to spend on things. And so if I have like, you know, 10 ideas or 10 things, but I realize that the clock is ticking with you know the amount of time I have, even in my own life. You know, I think about it. I have to choose, and so that's sort of how it how it works out. And I do a lot of projects actually that have no no strong audience, and a lot of projects that I don't think other people like, um, but I I think they're important, and so I do them. And so um, they're all most of them are on my website though, and so you'll see some weird stuff. You know, that's just like what the hell, and it's just because it's not. Um, yeah, it doesn't get shown at say like MoMA, you know, or SF MoMA or any of these places, but I feel like they do need to exist. Interesting question indeed. Like, when do you know that it's right? You know, like when, is it, when does it feel right? Um, and one more from online or should we, should, you know? Yeah, okay. Last one, last question. Okay. Um... Here we go. Okay, um, Dania asks, how do you feel about that childhood photo growing up? <laughs> I love it. I mean, look at me, I'm, I'm so angry. You know, I'm this, yeah, it, and my mom is so beautiful. You know, she was like, I think, what, 20, 21? You know, she was young and, um, and you know, I literally just rediscovered it a couple of years ago and realized how sort of metaphoric it was. You know, it's like years, you know, 47 years later, I'm still grappling with what it means to, you know, to inhabit this kind of uh, costume of America. You know, it's like, it, as soon as I saw this photo again, um, it sort of, it all just dawned on me, like what I was trying to work through. That. We wish you well, and thank you so much for a very generous and thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. I Great. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.